so good to be back with you again. And uh, man, great to, great to worship with you guys. Thank you, Derek, and, and all of you guys. What a, what a great team. And look at this. Since last time I was here, wow, this is amazing. And uh, I got to tell you, I think we probably brought some of the moisture with us. Sorry. Uh, it was an interesting fly day today as we flew from Colorado Springs here. We were very grateful that we got here. And of course, we're believing God that we would be able to uh, arrive without any challenges. And uh, we, we flew around some weather. We had to get rerouted. And, and uh, I believe it's about 24 inches of snow at the college right now in Woodland Park, Colorado. And so uh, one more time, we have springtime in the Rockies. So there's a lot of moisture going on right now. And uh, we're experiencing that in Southern style, <laughs> right? So it is good to be here. Listen, this is going to be an exciting weekend. I know this is a God-ordained time. And uh, if you can, I know whenever you're local, it's a whole different thing than if you go to a conference somewhere else where you, you know, are staying in a hotel or whatever, and you have to be at the conference kind of thing. When, you're, when it's in your hometown, you got all kinds of stuff going on, and it's hard to sometimes come to a whole series of meetings. But I just want to encourage you, I'm going to build on this this weekend, and uh, we're going to be having several sessions together. And I understand that many of you have been through my prayer training, and so thank you for going through that, those of you who have. But I would love to uh, have you bring friends you know, bring people that you know maybe are walking through a healing journey, and we're going to build this and find out what God's Word really has to say about living a healthy lifestyle, living in wellness, living in health. When we do need to be healed, is healing really available? How do we know it is? Is it God's will to heal all the time? Well, then what about so-and-so who loved Jesus with all of her heart and is now dead, you know? We're going to be talking about all those kinds of things, and we're going to get real. So, you know, I discovered a long time ago that realness does not scare Jesus. So rather than try to fake liberty, fake freedom, fake something, praise God, we can be real and just apply the truth to our reality and watch the truth bring change to our reality. Because how many you know that God's word, John 17, 17 says, thy word, O Lord, is truth. So when we apply truth to our reality, whatever it is, if it's a family situation, if it's our finances, if it's a relationship situation, whatever it is, as we begin to apply truth to our reality, truth always trumps reality. And people say oftentimes, I just want to be real. And in their effort to be real, what they really want to do is just live in unbelief. How many know there's a difference between being real and being in unbelief and doubt? So what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to be real, but we're going to put truth on reality and watch truth bring change that only truth can do. God's not just interested in getting you information. He is interested in bringing transformation. So speaking of transformation, I'm so blessed I get to be here with my sweetheart of, uh-oh, I'm in trouble, 39 years in June coming up. Would you welcome Tracy tonight? So great to have her here. We have two children who are grown, and we have three grandchildren. And it is just awesome to see what God is doing in terms of his faithfulness. How many know that even when we're not faithful, God always remains faithful? Every one of us, if we were to have time to have coffee together, we would find out that every one of us have family situations going on that are not where we necessarily want them to be right now. Or we've got situations in our lives that may be storms or may be trials that we're walking through. And, you know, the temptation for people who are not in, quote, full-time ministry, as we typically think of it, is that people on the platform like myself have it all together and everything about us is just honky-dory. Well, y'all know that's not true, right? That may be your reality, but we're going to put truth on that and bring some new reality to you. Because how many know that Jesus said, in this world, you are going to have trouble? Well, I don't want that promise. 
Thank you very much, Jesus. You can keep that promise. No, it doesn't work that way. All the promises are yes and amen, including that one. In this world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer because I have overcome. Well, why is that we should be of good cheer? First time I heard that, it's like, yeah, that's easy for you to say. You be of good cheer. You don't know what I've been going through. See? But he says, be of good cheer because I have overcome. Because you know what? If Jesus has overcome, that means you are an overcomer. As we begin to identify with his life instead of our reality, as we begin to identify with truth, you know what? We're going to go countercultural to where culture is going today. Listen, if you tell some friends this weekend that you were at a conference where they believe in divine healing, get your camera ready for their reaction. How many know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, you're one of those, huh? You know why? Because our culture is totally comfortable with living medicated. Our culture is totally comfortable with being okay on prescription drugs. And all of the side effects of prescription drugs will kill you more than the disease. All you got to do is watch television for a little while. And, you know, in between the show will be all these commercials that talk about these various prescriptions. And as they talk about how you have to have that Ambien in order to live life well, they've got violin music in the background and, and people who are slowly running along the beach as their hair is blowing in the wind. And, and then they give you the side effects, including death. Well, thank you very much. You know what? I'd rather die of the disease than die of all those multiple, you know, symptoms that come from a, am I saying that it's, it's not okay to take prescription drugs? No, I'm not saying that. If that's where you are, you know what? God's going to meet you where you are. God wants you well, but he's going to tell us that there's a better way. We don't have to be conformed to culture, but we can be not just informed, we can be transformed. And as we begin to live in this place of transformation, we begin to find out John 10.10 10 for us personally is really true, that Jesus came to give us life and to give it to us what? More abundantly. See, that's true for every area of our lives. So I grew up in a, in a Baptist uh, home. My dad was a Baptist pastor. And uh, I always... I can't remember not knowing about Jesus and not loving God. I mean, I've, I've loved God all of my life. I can't remember not loving God. I was born again at five years old. And uh, so growing up in that atmosphere for me, uh, we didn't necessarily teach sickness, but we didn't know that it was God's will always for us to walk in wellness and health. We actually thought that if you got sick, it might actually be God who was giving you the sickness to try to teach you something so that perhaps in your process of learning something, you could really be super spiritual. Why are you laughing? How many grew up Baptist? All right, how many grew up in some other denomination that was similar to what I'm talking about right now? And you know what? You were, you were really spiritual if you could glorify God in the sickness, not, not so much in the sickness, but because of the sickness. See? So we took it a step further, and we actually came to expect certain things, like, for instance, flu season. Tracy and I were in Whole Foods the other day. We should probably own stock in Whole Foods, but uh, it's one of our favorite stores, and, and we're going in past the er uh, area where all of the natural pharmaceutical type, what do you call those things, like vitamins and you know, supplements, there you go, the supplement section, right? And on the end of the aisle is a sweet little chalkboard that's about that big, and it's got little tulips coming up on the bottom, and it says, flu season is here. Allergy season is here. I'm like, well, who knew? We thought it was Christmas, and then it was Easter, and, you know, now it's allergy season. Are you prepared? Have you got your whatever, whatever, whatever to get prepared? 
See, what do we do? We begin to get conformed to culture in ways we don't even know we're being conformed. We're listening to movies and watching TV, and in between, we probably see 20 different commercials about prescription drugs. And we begin so, uh, we, we start to get so familiar with all of this that we actually think it's normal. Well, it's not normal, it's weird. Come on, tell your neighbor, that's not normal, that's weird. Now here's what is normal. It is normal for the Christian to learn to live in health and wellness by the Word of God and allowing the Word of God to prosper us from the inside out to where we can live life abundantly. We can live in the blessing of the Lord. And in that blessing of the Lord, we find out that God has a higher standard for us to be able to live in, not just for ourselves, but in this place of living like this, we get to become so uh, cooperative with the Holy Ghost that we begin to give out of the abundance of our heart. And such as I have, and now that I know that I have it, instead of the flu, what do I have? I've got the life of God living in me. I got the healer living in me. And so what am I going to give? Such as I have, give I you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. In the name of Jesus. And we begin to learn how to cooperate with what God has already done in Christ. And we begin to live life in a whole different way. Well, it's gotten pretty fun, I got to tell you. You know, when I was living in my high school years as a Baptist kid, I thought, one of my scariest moments was if I really gave my heart and my life to Jesus, oh, he'd probably send me to Africa and I'd have to live in a mud hut. I just, you know, I just knew if I really just surrendered all, you know, I surrender all. No, I don't. Because you know what? As soon as I do, he's going to ask me to go to Africa and live in a mud hut. I just know it. Anybody been there? You know what? I am having more fun now than I have ever had in my life. I'm telling you what, the kingdom of God is amazing. And as we learn to live spirit-filled, we are going to have a quality of life that the world cannot duplicate. This is abundant life. This isn't just about healing. This is about living in the overflow of God's word and God's spirit every single day. See? So God meets us in these places of reality and brings us into his purpose and his plan so that we can reach out to other people and help other people. Well, we're going to talk about that this weekend because it gets to be really fun. Like when you go to Walmart, Walmart is the most amazing place for ministry. You're like, seriously, you love Walmart? You all need to pray for me, you know? No, what a great place for ministry. You go into Walmart, you go wherever you go as, a, as an agent of the kingdom of God. And, and, and man, airports, are you kidding me? Airports are amazing places. Airplanes, you have a captive audience. Where are they going to go? <laughs> right? And you begin to see as God sees. You begin to hear what what God is, is saying and what he's doing, and you let that life flow through you. So now it's not just about you receiving healing, but now it's letting that life flow through you and bringing it to somebody else. And in this place of living to give is where the adventure really begins. So I'm telling you, we are in for a great weekend. I know you all believe this already or you wouldn't be here. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to get into the Word of God. We're going to find out a lot more about this, and we're going to have a good time together. And I believe tomorrow is going to be a lot quieter than tonight, <laughs> rain-wise. Amen? Amen? Now, y'all pray for Colorado because, you know, we've had a really dry uh, winter, actually. And so we're thankful for the moisture, but it just seems to be coming in 18 inches at a time in the form of snow. But you know what? That's okay. My wife's one of those people, when, if you get to know her this weekend a little bit, she is like a snow fanatic. She loves snow. I mean, the more snow, the better, you know? And, you know, put the fireplace on and get a good book and some hot coffee and some hot chocolate. Let's do this, you know? Uh, that's my wife. But, you know, however the moisture comes, what a blessing to be able to soak that ground with that moisture. 
And as that moisture comes, what happens to the ground? Whatever has been planted in it begins to, well, why would you be any different? See, people say, yeah, I heard, I heard that teaching 25 years ago. I believe that. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you know, I remember one time when I was living in Tulsa, I was in Tulsa for, I guess, most of the 80s, you know, and uh, I was the worship leader at a church there called Grace. And um, so we, we heard Brother Hagen a lot uh, when we were there and even before we got there. But... Uh, I remember one time he got up to minister and he said, you know, open up your Bibles to Mark 11, chapter, you know, chapter 11, verse, I'm, th I'm thinking, oh, here we go again. Mark 11, 23 and 24. How many times are we going to hear Mark 11? You know, and the Spirit of God really brought me into a place where he led me in that moment into truth. You know, he said to me, oh, so you, you've already heard it all. And as I repented and humbled myself, I began to learn that, you know what? As I sat under that watering, as I sat under that refreshing that God was bringing, something new began to sprout out of me. Something new that was planted in me began to find fertile ground. And in this place, it was like I heard it for the first time. Bill Johnson was ministering uh, not too long ago, and he was saying something about how the blessing of the Lord makes rich and adds no sorrow. I've heard that at least a hundred times if I've heard it once, maybe hundreds of times. But you know what? In that moment, I heard it. And it was like I realized it wasn't my job, it wasn't my employment, it wasn't my you know, income streams, it wasn't my cleverness. It was the blessing of the Lord that made rich and added no sorrow. I heard it. So our prayer for you this weekend is that as we sit under the Word of God and we allow God to water and plant, you know what? He is the one that's going to bring the increase. So tell somebody next to you, God's going to bring increase to you this weekend. That's who God is. That's what God does. Hallelujah. Real quickly, I want to tell you that uh, Pastor Mark mentioned about the Healing is Here conference. And... Uh, we are, again, of course, having that conference in August of this, this summer season. August 9 through 12 is going to be our next Healing is Here event. But let me just tell you really quickly, it, is, it has truly been amazing uh, to be a part of this. And um, the, the, peop the students that, that have gone through the prayer training, as we call it, um, are now in the thousands. We, we've lost count of how many how many students have actually been trained in how to minister healing to people who are needing to receive that. And I'm going to talk about this tonight, and we're going to get into this a little bit, because one of the things that often happens is we think that it's up to us to make the healing happen. I've seen it over and over and over again. It's almost like we're, we're trying to convince God we're trying to do something to get God to finally give us our breakthrough. You know, Lord, you know. So we're going to find out that that's an old covenant model that's already been fulfilled. Let's not go there. We don't want that t-shirt. Been there, done that. Keep it there, right? But so many times it's based on what we are doing rather than based on what he's already done. And we know this, at least at some point, but we're going we're gonna to apply this in a really practical way this weekend. But saying all that to say that there have been thousands of prayer ministers now that have been trained all over the world, and this message of how God wants us well is really beginning to take root. We're seeing the fruit of it literally worldwide. It's incredible. But when we were having our first Healing is Here conference, we had, we had been trying to go on the road and bring... Uh, healing on the road, and we will always do that, and, and I will always do that. But we were getting requests from all over the place, and we just couldn't make it happen. I mean, I was teaching, I had my schedule. Ah, oh. sounds good, doesn't it? Already getting quieter. Um, I have my schedule of my classes that I'm teaching, and, and we're getting invitations now to go international. And, and what do we do? Well, thank God for live stream, number one. 
Because right now, even as we're live streaming, this, this group that's here, which is a great looking group, by the way, y'all look good. Tell somebody, you look good. Come on, tell somebody. But you know what? What we've got going on here is being live streamed around the world. And, and this is available for people who want to join. And thank God for the technology of the internet. And um, so as these, as these conferences started to happen, this first one in 2014, we didn't know how many people were going to be coming. We ended up having so many people, we couldn't even get them in the auditorium. It was like overflow out of the auditorium going downstairs. Um, and as we began the conference, you know, it was very similar to maybe what some of you have said tonight. I, I, if I can just get to that Birmingham, Alabama healing conference, I'm going to receive my healing. You know what? Yes, you are. If you've said that, if you've confessed that, man, we are in agreement with that. And I believe you are going to receive your healing this weekend. And it's like the woman who had the issue of blood. And she said, if I can just touch his garment, that's where she was at. And she spoke out where she was at and declared it. And how many know that because of her faith, she received it? Amen. So as we began the conference, it was literally like putting a match to gasoline. I mean, it was just like all of a sudden, all over this place, you know, I mean, hundreds, you know, I don't even know how many people we had. I think we had around 1,400, 1,500 people, something like that. People began to get up out of wheelchairs. People began to take off breathing apparatuses. People who were walking in on crutches and walkers began to discard them and throw them to the side, even before they got into the healing lines at the end of the services. They couldn't even wait until somebody could actually lay hands on them. They're like, I'm done with this stupid wheelchair. I'm done with this walker. If Jesus already paid it all, then what am I doing with this thing? You know? And all of a sudden, faith just began to erupt from the inside out, and we began to see all kinds of supernatural manifestations of what Jesus has already accomplished. Yes. It wasn't like Jesus just showed up in Woodland Park, Colorado, and said, all right, y'all, you've been praying for a long time. I'm going to just go ahead and heal everybody right now. This is probably a good time to do this. How I know Jesus already healed 2,000 years ago? And when we get that settled in our hearts, where we really begin to realize that the price was paid, then we learn how to cooperate with the Spirit of God and how to receive the provision. But right now in the church, I'm telling you, the Bible says in the last days, there's going to be doctrines of devils that are going to infiltrate the church, and one of them is the doctrine of sickness. It is so normal in many circles today, that if you tell somebody they can be supernaturally healed, they will fight you to stay sick. Now, I know that sounds really weird and like, oh, yeah, sure. No, I, trust me, I've experienced it many times. As the director of our healing school at Karis Bible College, I've had people fight me to stay sick. So we have right now five years of archives of healing schools. We have healing school once a week, typically on a Thursday. We've now started an evening healing school, but we're not live streaming it yet. But it's once a month, in addition to our daytime healing schools. But we have five years archived of different teachers who are teaching through, through the healing school. So I tell people all the time, if you, if you really want to stay sick, it's going to be really hard to do that here. We're going to make it really hard for you to stay sick. Amen. Because as you start getting marinated, how many of you know if you want to marinate a really good steak? Oh, that sounds good right now. Mm. Come on, anybody got a witness tonight? Praise God. Get a good marinade going on and get that steak on the barbecue. And, you know. Well, how many of you know if you're going to marinate a steak, you can't just put it in the marinade for two minutes and lift it back out and call it good. Why? Because it's not going to take on the flavor. But when you marinate a steak, you get it in that marinade, and you have it be in there for a while, then you get that thing on the grill. Oh, yeah, Bubba, come on. We're talking some good flavor. Well, how many know the Lord says to taste and see that he is good? When we spend time in the Word, we spend time in the, in the Spirit, we begin to take on the flavor. We begin to take on the 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 flavor is the best word I can think of, of God himself. 
And here's what happens with sickness and disease. As you begin to not just renew your mind, but you really literally begin to restore your soul. We're going to talk about that. It's not just the renewing of the mind. That is super, super important. But it's the restoring of the soul. And in this process of the restoration of the soul, you begin to take on a brand new flavor called spirit and truth. And guess what happens to body? Body begins to actually change and become conformed to what's alive and powerful. I have seen this now, I, I would probably be safe to say hundreds of times, where people who have cancer, for instance, come in and whatever the doctor has given them for their prognosis or their diagnosis, they've got something going on that's, you know, not good, and medically speaking. And they begin to sit under the Word of God, they begin to believe God's, God's report, you know, not the doctor's report, but whose report will you believe? They begin to believe the report of the Lord. And as they sit in this process many times, it's not an instantaneous healing. And, and thank God, we've seen thousands of instantaneous healings. And I love that when that happens. But many times it doesn't happen that way. And so if it doesn't happen that way, often the person will feel discouraged because that's what they wanted was just a, you know, a zap. And we're done with this thing, you know? Well, probably there is something going on within the soul of that person that is not allowing them to receive that way. So for them, it's going to become a process. But the good news is we've seen that process manifest in full healing now thousands and thousands of times. So what happens, for instance, to cancer? You have a medical report, and I'm just picking cancer out of the air because I hate it so much. Amen. I hate cancer. I hate all sickness and disease. I remember Andrew was teaching one time at a gospel truth rally, and he said, you know, uh, I haven't uh, had sickness dominate me in 40-some years. I've had stuff come against me, but it has not dominated me in 40-some years. I can't remember the word he actually used, but it was something like that. And he paused and he said, but that's because I hate sickness more than you do. And I remember I was sitting right where Tracy is, and I'm like, oh, yeah? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm saying to myself, oh, yeah? <laughs> you know what? We got to get to the place. You know, the Bible says if we love God, we are going to hate evil. If you love God, what do you do? You hate evil. I love what God loves. I hate what God hates. What does he hate? Evil. Well, you know what? Cancer is evil. Sickness and disease is not godly. It's evil. Amen. And this doctrine of devils has infiltrated the church to where if you believe in supernatural healing and deliverance and zoe life of God, you know what? You're the weirdo. Well, no, not anymore. We're changing that culture, praise God. We're not going to live under the, world of the, way, the ways of the world. We're going to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and the restoring of our soul. And we're going to say, you know what? I'm going to take on the marinade of spirit and truth and watch the DNA of my body actually physically change. You came in with cancer. You leave without it. How on earth is that possible? Because of the Word of God. That's how alive and how powerful the Word of God actually is. And you know what? It's not just big stuff like cancer. Because here's the deal. Whatever you can tolerate, you will live with. Let's just say it's sinus problems. It's no big deal. Just a little sinus. All right, well, go ahead and live with it then. See? You can. Jesus will still love you. He's not going to love you any less. Just because you, you know, have sinus problems, right? It's just a little headache that I get, you know, every three or four days and, you know, it's okay. I, you know, okay. It's not going to mean that Jesus is going to love you less. It just means that you don't have to live with that thing. You can believe God and learn to walk in health and wholeness. And this is God's plan for every believer. So, don't tell me that it doesn't work today or that miracles have passed away. Don't tell me that it's not effective anymore because when the last apostle died on the earth, healing went with him. 
No, healing is here. Amen? Amen? Healing is here. The gifts of the Spirit are alive and well. Thank you, Jesus. Miracles are here. Health and wellness. If it's instantaneous, if it's a process, it doesn't matter. God wants you well. Hallelujah. He paid an incredible price for you to walk in the fullness of your redemption and your salvation. And Jesus wants us not only to get it for ourselves, but he wants us to so get it that we're able to give it to somebody else. Amen. Tell somebody tonight, such as I have, have. I'm going to start giving to somebody else. To to yeah, tell somebody else. Just say it again. Such as I have, I'm going to start giving it to somebody else. Amen. Somebody said, well, you're full of something. <laughs> Especially when you start talking like this. See? You know, people are okay if you just talk about salvation. Well, most people. Unless you watch Oprah a lot. You know, how many know she's got her own doctrine of salvation? See? All roads lead to God, don't you know? Jesus is just a way. He's not the way. See? And, and you know what? If we're not careful, we're going to let a little bit of the world's philosophy come in and start to marinate us just a little bit. Just a little, you know, it's not, you know, just a little leaven. And all of a sudden, we are so marinated in unbelief, we don't even recognize it. And, and here's what we're going to find out this weekend. Most people think that their issue is that they have a lack of faith. If you talk to people about healing and wellness and health, people, most people, even Christians, now I'm not talking about unbelievers, I'm talking about believers who are attending church, their issue is going to be, I just need more faith. And I tell you what, it's discouraging when you're running around from conference to conference, from meeting to meeting, trying to get more faith. Man, I was there for years and years. I was in the Word of Faith movement and and, and all of that for a long time, and I thank God for it. I learned a lot of great things. But I tell you what, when I uh, got turned on to the grace message, my whole life began to change so much because I began to realize that I've got the same faith that raised Jesus from the dead already on the inside of me. It, why would I be thinking that I've got to get more faith if I've got that faith? If, if God's given every man the measure of faith, what is that measure, the same faith that raised Jesus from the dead? Then what am I doing trying to get more? See, I just got to recognize what I have and realize I don't have a faith problem. What I have is an unbelief challenge. And my culture is so pressing in on me with unbelief that I've accepted it as normal. I've become marinated in unbelief to where I think it's the way it should be. I don't even recognize it. So when someone comes and tells me that I can live life supernaturally, I can live life in a healthy way, I think, oh yeah, well, good for you, you weirdo. <laughs> right? So now I'm like, no, you know what? I'm going to hate sickness more than you. When I see someone who's struggling, I'm not okay with that. See? When I go to Walmart and I see these people in walkers and, you know, man, Tracy, you know, when we're out shopping together, I don't shop very often. She does most of the shopping for us, but, you know, every now and then we'll be there together and I'll see somebody in some kind of condition and she knows, you know, just because of this passion that's in my heart and because we have the Holy Ghost, really. And I'll see somebody and she'll be like, uh-oh, here we go. You know, it can turn your shopping trip into a long whole deal. Man, get over there in the produce section and they got the natural fruit and then God shows up with the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> and such as I have, give I, I'm telling you, it's amazing. We work out at 24-hour fitness in Colorado Springs and one day this lady was on this treadmill and all of a sudden she was, you know, I don't know what happened. She was jogging one minute and the next minute she fell off the thing and was on the floor. And Everybody just kept on working out like they were on their ellipticals, like, oh, that was weird. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, really? And I, when I saw her fall off of there, I immediately stopped and I came over and I said, uh, ma'am, are you all right? 
And she was not okay. I mean, she, I don't know what was really going on, but she was crying. She was upset. She was probably more shocked than anything, but she was obviously in pain. And so I could have just said to her, you know, I'm sorry you fell. God bless you. Be warm and filled. <laughs> Jesus loves you. That's not going to work for me anymore. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I walked over to her and I said, uh, I believe in healing and I see in crazy, amazing things happen. Can I pray for you? And she kind of looked at me like, yeah, <laughs> like that's weird, but okay. So I just laid my hands on her and I said, father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for providing healing. I speak to this body now and I command this body to come into alignment to the finished work of Jesus in Jesus name. She goes, oh, whoa. And then she goes, who are you? <laughs> I said, it's not important who I am. It's who Jesus is. He's already paid the price, not me. I went back and I started exercising and doing what I was doing before. She kind of went off someplace. And, and about 15 minutes later, I moved to a different part of the gym and I saw her telling two or three of her girlfriends and she was going like this, that's him. Come on, you're like a party waiting to happen. You know, you are like healing waiting to happen for somebody. And when you begin to live like this, I'm telling you, the kingdom of God that's in you is gonna come up out of you. And it's not just something you do, it's who you are. Your life is in him. It's in him that you live and move and have your being. And in this place, I'm telling you, miracles, all kinds of divine appointments are waiting to happen. Listen, you know what? I am so done arguing and trying to convince people of the truth. I'm not going to argue and debate the truth with you anymore. If you want to be ignorant, like the Apostle Paul said, and how many know there are some people who really do want to be stupid? I'm not trying to be mean. It's just truth. There are some people who just want to be ignorant. So you know what? If you want to be ignorant, be ignorant. But if you really want deliverance, if you really want to be healed, if you really want to live life like Jesus came to give it, then here's the deal. As a minister, as a believer, and I'm going to say as a believer because I don't want you to see me as the minister and you as the non-minister. How do you know that if you're a believer here tonight, you are a minister? Every one of us are a minister. I just happen to be up on the platform tonight teaching. But every one of us have this ministry of reconciliation if we are a believer. And in this ministry, this believer's ministry, we can have signs and wonders following us wherever we go. See, this is the normal Christian life. This is not weird. This is the redefined definition of normal. Amen. I like this. This is good. It's like, you know, uh, 60 is the new 40. How many kind of like that? Yeah, see? How many know that in our culture today, once you're 40, you're over the hill? What? Who said? Who told you? Well, somebody did. And then, you know what, once you're over the hill, here's what you can start to expect. What's the first thing to start to go? Your hearing. What? <laughs> and then after your hearing starts to go, what's next? Your eyesight. You know, you're 60 now. You can just expect to, you know, that's what happens when you're, oh my goodness. I just want to hurt somebody. <laughs> Spirit of slap wants to come on me and just, you know, Lay hands on you suddenly, praise God. Give you a little five-fold ministry, you know. <laughs> so you know what we do as we begin to age? We put our expectation in being conformed to the ways of the world. See? And, and we think these things are just normal, you know? Well, I'm such and such an age now. I should just expect this. No, you shouldn't. What you should do is get into the Word of God and reset your expectations. Amen. 
Not learn to tolerate it, but reset your expectations. Listen, those of you who are older here, and I'm not even going to define what older is because I just turned 65, and now 65 looks really young to me. But when I was like in my 20s, I thought 65 was like next to the grave. I mean, man. Probably just be on oxygen and, you know, hobbling around and, you know. Man, I tell you what, the kingdom of God in you, listen, there is no time for us as older people to be retiring in the kingdom. You might be retiring in your job or the natural realm, but in the kingdom of God, there is no retire. It's time for us to refire. Amen? It's time for us to activate into the things of the Spirit because as older people, we need to be reaching down to the younger generation and saying, this is what's normal. This is what you can expect. And as we age, don't fear aging. Because we're going to age well. Man, come on. It's just going to get gooder and gooder. Hallelujah. And you know what? The best is yet to come. Because when we go out of here, we're not going to go out of here sick. I had one, one person in the healing school absolutely get upset with me when I said, you don't have to be sick to die. She said, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Of course you do. How else would you die? <laughs> Isn't that great? See, people are so accustomed to be conformed to the ways of the world instead of God's ways. Man, you know what? How many of you know who Charles Capps is? You may know? Okay. So Charles Capps uh, passed away last year, and he called Happy Caldwell on Saturday, and he said, Happy, I'm going to go be with Jesus tomorrow. I just wanted to say goodbye. I'm like, seriously? You know, Happy is one of our teachers at the school, and so he was telling the story just a little while ago, and he said, yeah, uh, uh, you know, Charles Capps called me, and he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go be with Jesus uh, uh, tomorrow around noon, and I just wanted to thank you for everything you've done for me, and, and what a blessing you've been. I wanted to just tell you as, as such a good friend, uh, thank you and goodbye. And so they had that conversation. That was Saturday. Sunday, at 10 o'clock, he was reading the paper and uh, just hanging out. His family, he had told his family he was going to, you know, go see Jesus. And they're like, Papa, don't say that. And he's like, of course I'm going to say that. That's what, that's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to go be with the Lord. And at about 10 o'clock, he folded the paper, laid it over the side, and went to go be with Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Man, that's how to go. Yeah. See, why do we have to die sick? Yeah. Why do we have to let sickness take us out? No, we don't have to. See, Jesus said, I came to give you life and I came to give you more abundantly. And listen, when you begin to realize the price that Jesus paid in order for you to live like this, man, you're going to start hating sickness like I do. You're going to start loving life like I do. And you're going to begin to realize, you know what? I'm not going to retire. I'm going to refire. And I'm going to reach down in my generation. I'm going to bring good news to a, to a whole generation right now that's getting so crazy, they don't even know what bathroom to use. Okay, we just went there. <laughs> oh, my goodness. They don't know if they're a man or a woman or what they are. And now culture is telling us to accept this because this is the new normal. No, I'm telling you, that's not the new normal, but we're going to create the new normal from the kingdom of God. We're going to make miracles normal. We're going to make healing normal. We're going to make forgiveness of sin normal. We're going to make restoration normal. And we're going to let God add his super to our natural and watch what happens in the glory of God. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. So this doctrine of sickness that has infiltrated the church today is not just a little every pocket here and there kind of thing. Let me tell you, it's church wide. And it is a big deal. Man, and I'm so grateful to be with a ministry, a college, a, a, you know, a, a ministry that is teaching wellness and health and, and healing. I'm so grateful for Andrew and Jamie Womack who have been preaching this message for so many years. And Tracy and I feel so blessed to be you know, involved with someone who has this anointing, who has this, this DNA, if you will, not only just as a philosophy, but operating in their lives and truly walking in the fruit of it. It doesn't mean that you don't ever have a problem, you know? Andrew's had all kinds of stuff that he's walked through. 
and not just 25 years ago, but recently. Jamie Womack actually died about uh, a year and a half ago with an incident where uh, she fell on her camera. She had one of those big, you know, what we would call now like an old-fashioned camera, the kind of the lens that comes out, you know, like a real camera. Because, you know, I'm saying that because most people now don't even know what that looks like. <laughs> because now it's all about the smartphone. Yeah. You know, I mean, who carries a, a camera and a phone, right? <laughs> so anyway, she had one of those really nice cameras, and, and they were out, and, and she tripped on something and fell. And when she fell, that extended lens part fell against her chest. And when she fell on it, it stopped her heart. And this is, Andrew has seen people raised from the dead five times personally and seen, you know, in ministry lots of times, but uh, five times personally he's been involved with, uh, with raising someone from the dead. And so when this happened, uh, Jamie wasn't breathing, her heart had stopped, and instead of panicking, he began to just speak the Word of God and literally saw Jamie come back from, from absolutely out, 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 to breathing again. Now, here's what was really funny. They wanted to get her checked out medically after she came back, and so they called 911, and uh, <laughs> when the guy in, in 911 said, uh, what is your location, please? They were in a cemetery. True story. So I just kind of have this picture of what it must have been like to be that 911 operator getting a call from someone in the cemetery <laughs> calling 911. You know, I love that. Listen, I think we're going to see a lot more resurrection. I think we're going to see a lot more supernatural restoration and resurrection taking place in all kinds of families all kinds of situations, even here this weekend. Yes. Some of you have given up. You've said, you know what? I think this is the way it's going to be. I love Jesus. Jesus loves me. I know we're good. But you know what? You've just settled into the, to, into the normal that you've been used to. But God is going to reset your clock. God is going to reset and give you a new number to call. And it's going to be a 911 in the spirit to say, thank you, Jesus. You've already done what needed to be done. And I'm going to hook up with this because you know what? That price has been a tremendous price. So saying all that to say that this doctrine of sickness that has infiltrated the church, why is it so prevalent today? You know why? It's because we don't believe healing was provided in the atonement. We believe that when Jesus died on the cross, it was the forgiveness of sin, that's it. So I wanna spend a few minutes tonight and then we're gonna unpack this further. And sometime this weekend, I would love to, uh, for us to actually receive communion together as a part of the uh, celebration of what God did in the atonement. And we're gonna, we're gonna get into this in terms of even communion how religious people get when it comes to receiving communion. Uh, I was taught as a Baptist that you had to have communion in a really worthy manner because if it wasn't in a worthy manner, you were going to drink damnation to yourself. And so for us, we were like, or, or eat damnation to yourself. And so for us, the worthy manner meant that the music had to be just really holy. Oh, it's communion. You, you know, that was the worthy manner. So we tried to like get really holy in that moment so we wouldn't drink and eat damnation to ourselves. And so when communion would come around, we'd be like, I don't even know how to be really be like really holy, holy, holy right now, but whatever that's gonna look like for me, okay, here it is. So we would immediately get on this religious kind of attitude and think that's what scripture was being, you know, was really saying. Or here's the other thing I heard that if you don't discern the body of Christ correctly, and discerning the body of Christ correctly was to really be kind to all the other churches that don't believe like you believe, or um, you know these kinds of things. If, if someone's contrary to you doctrinally, 
you know, you need to just discern the body correctly and be loving and kind to them. And if you don't do that, then you're going to drink damnation, eat damnation to yourself. So it became very much this religious moment, and we missed the whole point of what communion is all about. So we're going to talk about that this weekend as well and then celebrate that. But I want to get into the Word of God a little bit, and uh, we don't have time, obviously, tonight to unpack very much of this, honestly. Uh, but let's go to Deuteronomy 28, and I want to begin to just talk a little bit about this process of atonement. Has healing really been provided in the atonement? And as you go to Deuteronomy 28, if you've got like a marker or some kind of something that you can just put there, uh, go ahead and do that, because I also want us to uh, look at a couple other scriptures, but I promise you we will get to Deuteronomy 28. So, First of all, was healing really provided in the atonement? Yes, it was. And in the beginning, God created all things in Genesis 1:31. Uh, in the beginning, God created all things, and he created them to be good. So when God created something, he said, it is good. And when he made man, what did he say? It is very good, okay? So everything that God made was good, but when he made man, he said, it is very good. Notice he did not make sickness. He did not put sickness in the garden and call it good. And the Bible says that in the last days, people are going to be calling evil good and good evil. Are you seeing it happening right now? Absolutely. In our culture today, this is rampant. If you believe what the Bible calls good to be good, the world typically is calling that evil. In fact, many of the world, uh, people in the world are calling you evil. Why? Because you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, you know what? You're a hater. If you're a Christian, you know what you are? You're intolerant. See? So all of these things start to become confused and blurred, and we're not even sure where we are in the mixture of the whole thing. And so what we end up doing typically is we begin to back off and we begin to go quiet and shift into neutral. Well, God's going to show us that whatever God does, it's always very good. Now, watch this. I'm going to make a statement, but I want you to really hear me clearly. God is always good. God is always good. But good is not always God. There's lots of good that is not God. And in fact, there's a tree called the knowledge of good and evil. And then there's a tree called the tree of life. God is always good. Good is not always God. We've got to learn what the kingdom looks like, what it sounds like. And when people begin to tell us that sickness is normal, that should raise a flag right away to where we go, you know what, no, that's not good. That, that can't be God. God is good. That, no, 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 no. So before the fall of Adam, there was no sickness. Sickness came into existence because of original sin. So we're going to find out that sickness and sin are linked together, but here's where most people get under condemnation, is because they think it's because of their personal sin that they have sickness, or someone's going to tell them, you know, the reason you have cancer is because, you know, you did this, this, and this. Well, wow, thank you so much for just putting me back under the law again, right? So it's not so much about your personal sin, even though personal sin could have opened up a door to what you're dealing with in terms of physical symptoms. It could. Like, for instance, unforgiveness is really stupid. Why? Because unforgiveness opens an access to the enemy in your life. It's not that God has brought that sickness on you. You've got an open door to the enemy to be able to say, come in and just hit me. You know, come in and, and shoot arrows at me. You know, so things like that are, are always lack of wisdom issues, lack of knowledge issues. They're just not smart. But sickness came in through original sin, not because of your personal sins. 
How many of those stuff in life just happens? You know, one of the things that people often struggle with is, you know, I love God, I'm believing God. Why am I even dealing with this? Why do I have to believe God for, for this particular physical issue when I've believed this for 25 years? Uh, why am I still dealing with this? Because life happens. Stuff happens in life. Why? You can thank Adam and Eve. Because of original sin. Now, the good news is if we just left here tonight with this, it would be pretty depressing. But we're going to find out when we get over to the new covenant that even though Adam opened up this door through original sin, the second Adam closed it. The second Adam paid the price for us that we could not pay in order for us to not have to live like the first Adam. Amen. And in this place of original sin, this is where sickness became a part of this whole thing that we call life. In Genesis 3, we find out that the ground was cursed because of sin. Adam at one time had dominion over the earth, but after he sinned, he and the earth were affected by that original sin from then on. Adam exposed all of us to the curse of sin that was released into the earth. So can we reverse this curse? Well, good question. How do we know that we're waiting for the redemption of our physical bodies into a glorified body? But what about now while we're living on the earth? Our bodies were made from the dust of the earth where the curse was put. We find out the ground was cursed. Well, guess what? Our bodies are made out of the ground. So our bodies were made from the dust of the earth, and what this first Adam lost for us, the second Adam has redeemed for us. So can we reverse the curse? Let's look at Romans 8. Told you we're going to get to Deuteronomy 28, but <laughs> let's look at Romans 8. For all of you using iPads and stuff, I apologize. It's much harder. Romans chapter 8, and let's begin at verse 18. Pastor Mark, how long do we have tonight, by the way? Until midnight, you know? Yeah? <laughs> okay, all right. Verse 18, Romans 8. For I consider that the sufferings, notice this, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now pause just for a minute, because when I was in the Baptist church, as soon as I heard that word sufferings, what did I think? Sickness. Sickness. Absolutely. These sufferings are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be. See, I, I told you, these sufferings are just from the Lord. No, we're not talking about sickness here. We're talking about the troubles and the challenges of life. In this life, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have sufferings. You're going to have persecution. There's going to be stuff that's going to be happening. Maybe it will come against you as sickness sometime. But listen, life happens. Don't be worried about what's happening to you. Be more concerned about what's happening in you. Amen. Now, look at verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into this glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? For if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. 
God has always wanted us to know him as the healer. We're going we're gonna to talk about this Romans 8 passage here just for a minute, but God has always wanted us to know him as the healer, even in the Old Testament, even before he could reveal the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. The world had not yet, the word rather, had not yet become flesh. So, again, without getting off into a long teaching on spirit, soul, and body, and I know Pastor Mark and Jennifer have taught you well in this area, uh, but how many know that our spirit man has already been redeemed? Our, our spirit man became brand new. When you became a believer, you, you know, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says you became a brand new created being. You became a brand new created species. You became a brand new person supernaturally in your spirit man. Did that take months and months to happen? Once you made that decision to receive the Lord Jesus into your life, was it a process or was it instant? How many vote process? Let's be democratic here tonight. No. No, it wasn't a process. It was instant. You became a brand new creation in an instant, right? Did your soul become brand new? Why? You are in the process of renewing your soul. Your soul is in the process of being restored. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. So guess what became redeemed already? Your spirit man. Guess what's in the process of being redeemed? Your soul. Guess what's going to be redeemed? Your body. See it. Okay? So in this process, we realize that the Spirit of God in me that has brought change to my spirit man is now in spirit and truth bringing change to my soul. And from the Spirit of God, I am learning to live in this place of being transformed. It's a process. How I think today is different than how I thought a year ago. How I think today is different than what I was thinking 10 years ago for sure. And you know what? How I'm feeling today how my will gets involved with the will of God is different today than it was 10 years ago. Everything that is in my soul, let's take a minute just to pause. What's in my soul? How many think your will is in your soul? Yeah? 90% says yes. All right. So the will is in our soul. What else is in our soul? our mind, right? My thought life, okay? How many know when you got born again, you still had some stinking thinking, right? You still had some funky stuff going on that needed to be transformed, right? Well, one of those, those areas might have been, like me, that it was the will of God for me to live in sickness, even embrace it to be, you know, something spiritual. So, my will, my mind, and what else? My emotions are all in my soul. I believe also my motivation and my imagination all are involved in the area of my soul. So this process for me is not overnight. It's lifelong. See? How I think today, how I, how I uh, operate emotionally today. And uh, Mike Braun, who is a graduate of of Karis and a good friend. Love having him here tonight and, and here at the church. But um, he's got some great teaching on this as well. And he can tell you that emotions will follow your thought life. And emotions are given to us by God. And emotions are really, really good. It's a good thing that we've got emotions. But you know what? Most people who start to learn to walk by faith feel that emotions are their problem because they don't want to be moved by what they feel. So what do we do? We try not to feel anything. And in trying not to feel anything, you know what any good therapist, spirit-filled therapist would tell you that that is on the edge of emotional illness. 
God does not want us to be emotionally ill. He does not want us to be mentally ill. He does not want us to be physically ill. He wants us to learn to walk in health and wellness from the inside out. So everything that is in my soul, my will, my emotions, my thoughts, my imagination, my motivation, all of it, God wants to help me learn to live in a place of healthiness. And as this happens, my body is going to start responding to what's going on in my inner man. Now, if we had time, Tracy asked me, in fact, tonight what I was going to be teaching on, and, and uh, she asked me if I was going to be teaching a little bit on the heart, because so much of the body of Christ does not really understand this process of the inner man. The spirit and the soul together make up the heart. And I used to think it was just my spirit man that was my heart, and, and I got myself into all kinds of trouble until I really began to hear good grace teaching. And once I connected this, that my spirit and my soul together make up the heart and the inner man and all of the issues of life flow out of my heart. So it's not just my spirit, but it's my spirit and my soul together, which is why this thing called life is such a process. We're always in the continuation of transformation. So what do I do? Watch this. In our culture today, how many times have you heard, listen to your body? It will tell you what you want to eat. I tried that. <laughs> I ate the whole pie. My body told me what I wanted to eat. And I ate the whole flipping pie. Just listen to your body. It'll tell you what, to, what, you, what you're really craving, what you're really wanting. You know what? And what we've done is we've accepted that as normal. Yeah, that's good, that's good counsel. I'm going to listen to my body. My body wants, you know, and have you noticed how your body rarely wants uh, wheat germ? <laughs> how your body hardly ever wants alfalfa sprouts? My wife tells me I need that, but my body never tells me that. See? <laughs> My body says dark chocolate. Mm, come on. Yeah. Jesus. Oh, come on. <laughs> Pastor, I feel it. See, my body's telling me, eat that whole pie. You know, here's what, okay, let me give you another example. Let's say you want to go on a diet. You're like, well, you don't really want to, but you know you need to. So you're like, okay, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to make up my mind. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to just have some willpower, bless God, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on a diet. So here's what we do. We begin to activate, not from the Spirit of God. This isn't the Spirit of God telling us to do this necessarily, but we've just made this decision on our own, and we're going to exercise willpower. How many heard that phrase? You got willpower. You can do this thing. Well, here's the difference. The Spirit of God has given us the fruit of the Spirit, and in that fruit, one of the fruit, of, of the fruit, of all the fruit, one of the fruit is the fruit of self-control. So watch this. If you don't exercise and live from this place of the Spirit of God from the inside out, if you go on a diet using self-control, you're going to be doing good. But here's what happens when you use willpower. You're like in the morning, you're like, all right, this is it. I'm losing 25 pounds, bless God. I am not going to eat another piece of cake. That's it. I got the power. <laughs> yeah. And you're not going to eat that piece of cake. You know by the end of the night, you've eaten the whole cake. <laughs> and then what do you do? You start to condemn yourself. It's self-condemnation. I'm just such a worm. Oh, my God. <laughs> And so you're activating from the soul because the soul always wants to be in control. But when you allow the Spirit of God through you and the fruit of the Spirit, you're going to begin to take dominion by the Spirit of God in you through the fruit of the Spirit. The same is true with sickness and disease. 
When you begin to take a little time and spend time looking into the mirror of God's word, you're going to get to the place where by the spirit of God, you're going to resist that sickness. You're going to resist that temptation to be conformed to the ways of the world instead of being transformed by the renewing of your mind. See? Well, emotions are this way as well. So as we begin to allow God to heal our emotions, instead of living by our emotions or being controlled by our emotions, now we're learning how to let our emotions be safely expressed through our spirit man. Remember what David said? Of course you do. Bless the Lord, O oh my, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. See, if we're going to, Derek, if we're going to worship God with emotion, you know, you know, here's what the, much of the church today worships like this. Let me just get on my soapbox for a, a couple seconds here. You know, bless the Lord, all my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, all my soul and all that is within me. Oh, sorry. All that, I showed a little emotion there. All that is within me. And then we say at the end of the service, you too can receive this same Jesus. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Who would want to? You're like, dude, you're like a funeral just waiting to happen somewhere. <laughs> Got that scary music going on and, you know, we're asking people, come be a part of the church. You're like, no, thank you. You're weird. See? But when we start realizing how God has created us for his glory, everything within us, everything with breath can praise the Lord. Man, with my breath in my lungs, I'm going to sing his praise. You are great. Hallelujah. Well, what happens? I begin to get marinated by the Spirit of God and just let the Spirit of God rise in me and begin to bring that transformation from truth and spirit. It's completely countercultural to how the world says we should be living. Well, don't wake me up if it's not true because it's working for me. Amen? And you know why? Because I know it is true. See? So watch this now. If we're going to allow the redemption of our spirit man to come up through us, in this life, we're going to learn how to live as overcomers. We're not going to wait till heaven. And here's why I know this to be true. In heaven, is there sickness? How do you know? How do you know? Talk to me. How do you know there's not heaven? What if you get up there and Jesus goes, infirmary, right over here. All you sick ones here. Tracy said, because he only did what the Father told him to do. Okay, well, that's good for earth, but uh, what about heaven? I mean, what if you get up there and there's like sin everywhere and what? Why are you looking at me like that? No? How do you know? You ever been there? You what? Uh-oh. She said it. She said, I believe. What do you believe? You believe that God's forgiven your sin? She's committed. Now, that's pretty bold because you know what? She's never been there. She's never been to heaven. Wait a minute. Are you, have you seen Jesus? Jesus? You, you, you believe in Jesus? Did you see him? Okay, so wait a minute. You not only believe in somebody you haven't seen, but you believe that God raises dead people. You're saying that God raised Jesus, who was dead, and raised him to life, and you believe God raises dead people, but you've never seen Jesus. But he's telling you that you're going to go to heaven and live forever, but you've never been there. And you're willing to risk your entire future on something you haven't seen, but something you believe. Your entire eternity 
you're willing to risk on this and you're sweating the small stuff? Yeah, but if I could just see the manifestation of my healing, then I would believe it. No, you wouldn't. What's easier to say, your sins be forgiven you or take up your bed and walk? Listen, the same Jesus who paid for your sin is the same Jesus who by his stripes you are healed. How are you going to know that you know that you know by the Word of God? We're not going to be unbelieving believers. We're going to be believers who believe. Amen? With that, let me share one last scripture, and then I'm going to wrap it up because I want to give us some time for ministry tonight as well. Now, Deuteronomy 28 <laughs> here's where we're going to find such joy because in the old covenant the whole purpose of the old covenant was to lead you into the new covenant the whole purpose of the old covenant was to be a schoolmaster to show you that you can't live this thing called life without christ there is no way that you can fulfill that old covenant. That was the purpose of it. It was a, a schoolmaster to bring you and train you into something that was going to be much better. And Jesus said the new covenant is better. It's better promises. It's just better, better, better all the way around. Amen. Well, here's the difference between the old and the new covenant. And one of the differences, I should probably say, but... Deuteronomy 28, uh, notice verse 15. We don't have time to read the whole chapter, even though it'd be great to go back with this understanding now. Because in the Old Covenant, uh, under the law, everything was based upon their behavior, wasn't it? They had to do in order to get. They had to do something in order to receive, Right? So what if they didn't do it correctly? What happened? Instead of being blessed, they would receive a curse. But they did something, and then they got something. They did something, they either got a blessing, they did something, they got a cursing, all right? How many know that much of the church is still in that philosophy? Much of the church is still living in that place of what we would now describe as legalism, right? The good news is the grace of God has come to bring us into the image of Christ. The grace of God has come to set us free. The grace of God has come to teach us how to live in this place of wellness and abundance and health and blessing. Hallelujah. Verse 15 says, but it shall come to pass if you do not obey. Everybody say, if you do not obey. Say it again. One more time. If you do not obey. It shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today that all of these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Now, if we took time to go through all of this today, we would find out that eventually one of the curses is the curse of sickness. Sickness was never a blessing, even under the old covenant, even under the law. Sickness was always a curse. Amen. Sickness was a judgment on that sin. And so in the new covenant, Jesus became the mediator, and through his obedience, everybody say, his obedience. His obedience. Say it again. His obedience. Through his obedience, he brought right standing or righteousness, he brought healing, he brought deliverance to us, and he became our sacrifice. Our only requirement was to believe it and put into action what we believed. Galatians 3.10 
says, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. The curse of the law was the law itself as a means of righteousness. What was the curse of the law? The curse of the law was the law itself as a means of to righteousness or right standing. Notice it didn't say Christ has redeemed us from the curses of the law. No one has the ability to successfully obey the law and therefore stand before the Father in righteousness. Wow. Look now at Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, just two verses uh, further down. You know this very well. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham, notice not the blessings, but the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So what we're going to find out is in the Old Covenant, it was always my obedience brought a blessing. My obedience brought a curse. It was my action to do something that would then get something. Now, if we were still living in that place today, which much of the church is, sadly to say, we would be continually in this process of trying to convince God to do something based on our behavior to do something based on our actions. But the good news is that Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law, and through his obedience, he did something for us that now has brought us blessing. He, he obeyed on our behalf, knowing we would never be able to, and brought us in his obedience, brought us his blessing that is now the blessing of Abraham. Relationship with him in a spirit and truth lifestyle. So the good news is that you are already healed. You are already forgiven. Someone said to me a few weeks ago, how can you say that all future sin has already been forgiven when you haven't even committed the sin yet? I said, that's a really good question. Let's, Let's think about that. So I said, you're okay with all of your past sins already being forgiven. Are you or, you know? And they said, oh yeah, I'm good with that. I said, so when do you think, if you could put a timeline on the first time you sinned, what year would that have been about? Oh, probably like maybe 1978. That was like a really scary year. And uh, you know, yeah, probably 78. And I said, okay, so that was your past sin. And, and all of that you're okay with, that's been forgiven, but the future sin has not been forgiven yet. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Now, here's what's so stupid about that way of thinking. <laughs> How long ago did Jesus die? And we're questioning 1978 compared to 2016? <laughs> Listen, if all of your sin wasn't forgiven at the cross you're in a serious heap of trouble. (laughs) So you know what? If all of your sin was forgiven, how about all of your sickness was already healed? You mean I don't have to try to do something to get God to heal me? Exactly. God is just telling us tonight, believe and receive. Just like you did for your sins being forgiven and you want to go to heaven, you're believing, you know. Yep, just like that. See? It's not any different. And as we unpack this this weekend, we're going to realize, you know what, if God is for you, even in your healing journey, if God is for you, even in that trial, that, that situation that's not going right now like you really want it to go, but you're believing God, maybe it's a relationship with a son, a daughter, a family member, maybe it's a a business thing, you know, whatever it is. Listen, God says, cast the care of that on me because I care for you. Love me because I first loved you. 
Don't love me to get, you to get him to love you, but love him because he first loved you. See, right in the middle of this healing process, God says, I want to meet you in that place because you know what? I've already brought the provision to you. Just believe and receive. Amen.